on, everybody? Elliot here the No Huddle Show at the scene of a crushing defeat. Oh, wait, sorry. That's Penn State. My bad. Sorry, I forgot wow. about it. Wow. <laughs> wow, wasting no time taking ha, ha, the pot ha, ha, shots today. I had to do it. I had to do it. No, hey, we, when does, uh, when's Temple season start? Temple doesn't have a season. It doesn't Oh, matter. okay, gotcha. <laughs> no, we are here at the link. We are here after the Eagles convincing 33. Well, maybe not convincing, but their big win over the 49ers, 33-10. to 10. They moved to 8-1. and one. They I mean, I think really all you can say about this game is they took care of business. I mean, I think that's that's really just what we saw out here. It wasn't pretty. Um, wasn't especially ugly. They didn't play a good team. I don't think they're going to be moving up in the power rankings. Went didn't help his MVP case, but they got the job done. Yeah, it was just a, a workmanlike professional effort from a team that's seven and one and setting the pace in both the NFC East and the conference standings. I mean, look, you're not going to blow every team out. They wound up winning the game today, thirty-three to ten. I think that through a, a, a large swath of this game. 49ers were never really in it, but the score was a lot closer than you would think it would be for a team that went over nine minutes without a first down, a team that through its first 10 drives punted eight times through two interceptions, one of which was a pick six. And the Eagles in the second half, they pulled away from the, the 49ers with some big plays. And I think, Elliot, the, the refrain that we've used basically ever since Carolina is, this is a Super Bowl caliber football team that the Eagles are that they have right now, and they're playing at a Super Bowl caliber level because even though the offense didn't carry them today, the defense made some big plays. They scored a touchdown. Special teams, even though Jake Elliott missed two extra points, Derek Barnett blocks the field goal. All three phases came up big in this game. They got the job done, and all that stands between them and the bye week is a game uh, next Sunday here against the Broncos, and they could be eight and one. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing. The Eagles have already made match their win total this season for all of last year. So, look, the Niners are not a good team. C.J. Bathard is not a good quarterback. There really was not really many impressive parts of this 49ers team. I mean, maybe the defensive line, but we can talk about that, whether that was more the Eagles' offensive line or the Niners' defensive line. But what you saw today was a team that just knows how to win. I mean, you can debate how much that Cowboys win meant in Week 17 last year, but they've won nine of their last ten games overall. So, You know, last year they were in a lot of close games they lost. They're learning how to win those games, and you saw this today. No, it wasn't especially close, but we've seen it, you know, not only in this game. We saw it against the Cardinals, a team that I picked them to lose against because I wasn't sure they'd be able to get up for a team that wasn't as good as them and a team that they were expected to beat big. I mean, the Eagles were, I believe, four and six or five and five in their last 10 games where they were double digit favorites. So it's not like, uh, you know, it was a guarantee they were going to win this game or cover. They end up doing both. Non-dominating fashion, um, one of the big stories coming into this game was the weather. Uh, it didn't really end up raining as much as I thought it was going to. Um, there were rain- some stretches where it was monsoon-like, though. Uh, maybe stretches. in the second quarter, but I think you know we were sitting in the press box prior to the game. It was really bad. Yep. It was worse during pregame than it was during the game. So I guess the one, first question I'll ask you is, how much do you think the weather played a role in this game, um, even though they did end up winning by 20 yeah, I, I don't think the weather was all that much of a factor, Elliot, and I think that if we just want to start on the matchup that was the most intriguing one going into the game that we talked about on Friday, was the 49ers defensive line against the Eagles offensive line. I talked to Brandon Brooks after the game. I talked to Lane Johnson after the game, and Lane basically said, that you know the offense got off to a slow start he shoulders a lot of that blame up front as an offensive line and Brooks told me on his walk out of the locker room that basically the 49ers showed up today and you could tell this based on some of their schemes they ran a lot of delayed blitzes they ran a lot of stunts uh Eric Reed the safety came on a couple delayed blitzes and it wasn't just the fact that Carson Wentz got sacked three times in the first half he was probably hit behind in the line of scrimmage he was hit a lot throws four or five times on top of that and Brandon Brooks told me on his way out of the stadium that you know they showed a lot of different things on the field versus what they saw on tape so the Eagles offensive line got some different looks from the 49ers and, and that's what an 0 7 team is going to do particularly when the strength of their team is their defensive line and their linebackers they did a really nice job of it early and then the Eagles went in at halftime made some adjustments made some protection adjustments up front didn't allow a sack the rest of the way so kudos to the offensive line and the coaching staff but you know the first half they looked over matched and like they didn't have any answers for that 49ers front seven so I was singing this during the game tell me if you think this is a good take or a bad take as much as I mean look some of the runs Wentz pulls off from these uh from these pressures are amazing I mean his one last year against the Redskins he uh you know he's done it all season really did it last year too but sometimes I look at him in that pocket and the pressure comes he ducks to try to hit to get the defender away from him and that defender either lands on his back or gets his hands on his back and sometimes especially today he was fighting off three four guys trying to continue the play so let me ask you 
I know that's. I mean, I know you want a player that plays the whistle, but I kept watching that thing like, man, he is going to get hurt one of these days, ducking yep. like that. And I mean, do you think that's something? Do you? I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think I'm, talk- I'm off base with that? No, or? no, no. We've talked about this dating back to Carolina, and I basically said that I thought it was foolhardy, and Frank Reich wasn't too thrilled about it the the Tuesday after. It was kind of foolhardy for Wentz to lower the shoulder down along the goal line. And I know we had the conversation about whether or not you want him to, you know, take those extra hits and lower the shoulder and make that play. But the the cumulative effect of all of those hits, it might add up. And the, the other side of that is games like today, games like the Redskins last week when he had that Houdini act in the pocket – all it takes is one hit. We mm-hmm. saw it with Aaron Rodgers. We saw it uh, with a couple quarterbacks across the league. All it takes is that one big hit, and you lose your quarterback, and it changes the scope of the, the season. I don't know what else he could have done today because there were times where he would get rid of the football, and within a split second, he'd get hit and driven to the ground. So I don't think today was a, ga- a day where he took unnecessary hits. I just think it was a day where, at least early on, it seemed like the Eagles' offensive line was overmatched, and I can't really blame Wentz for that. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, look, I thought when he ducked his shoulder against the Panthers and took on that cornerback, I was okay with that because you're going into the goal line. You have a guy that's smaller than you coming up to you. I'm okay with it in that situation. My only concern is if I'm the Eagles and I, you know, if I'm their fans watching, man, he takes some big hits in that pocket sometimes, and I'm not saying he could avoid all of them. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying just go down, but I do think he took a lot of hits today, and I thought it impacted his accuracy. Um, he started out well, but he he finished, I think, roughly a little over 50 percent with his passing. Um, so not great. The Eagles finished with, let me see how many offensive yards they finished here with. Uh, uh, total, total yards they wound up 304. With yep. So I mean, they moved the ball fairly well. Let's talk about the um, offensive line for a split second before we get into Alshon. I thought, I mean, the big question coming in was how is Vitae going to play? This is the first time Wentz has played without. Peters as his left tackle. I thought Vitae played okay. I think he gave up one sack maybe in the second quarter. I'm going to have to go back and watch the tape. But You make an argument that the second one was on him too, but Carson also held the ball a little bit too long in the pocket yeah. on the second But I, I just thought, and you and you said it and off what Brandon Brooks and other offensive linemen said, I thought a lot of the pressure that the, the 49ers got was off of blitzing and scheming. I didn't think you said, I didn't see Vitae getting beat left and right up and down the field. Yep. I mean, we talked on the previous podcast about whether this team should trade for a left tackle. Um, I know fans have been talking about it a lot. Trade deadlines Tuesday. Joe Staley uh, goes down today, so yeah. he's out of the mix. So there, yeah, there's one. Um, but I thought today watching, I didn't say to myself, all right, this is something that needs to be addressed. I thought Vitae did a pretty good job overall um, against, honestly, I mean, yeah, the Niners are 0-8 now, a talented defensive line of theirs. So I was encouraged by what I saw from Vitae today. See, here's the problem, and the problem comes in, I know that there aren't going to be that many opponents where you line up and you have three or four first-round picks on the defensive line and you have some really good linebackers. But the blueprint was authored today, and I wrote about it going into the game in the matchup post, and we talked about it a little bit on Friday, that the defensive coordinator for the 49ers was going to overload the left side of the field. They were going to blitz the left side of the field. They were going to try to overwhelm Vitae the same way that the Panthers did when he played right tackle. And for 30 minutes of football, it worked, and, mm-hmm. and the Eagles had no answer. And I think the two things they did is they slid some protection to that side of the field. They left Brent Selleck in a little bit longer. But in the second half, you saw a couple more play actions. You saw some quicker you know, slant routes. You saw Carson get rid of the ball quicker, and that's all fine and good. And, and you started the game, the show talking about Penn State. They lose their left tackle yesterday, and it's been Here an come issue. the excuses. No, no it's I'm not an excuse. I'm, 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 I'm making a comparison okay. in that – You've seen Penn State mask their offensive line issues by scheme, and it came back to bite them yesterday against Ohio State. They lost their left tackle, and Ohio State went wild and made all kinds Mm -hmm. of plays in the backfield. The Eagles can scheme around Vitae all you want, but you're going to face Khalil Mack. You're going to face Von Miller. You're going to face the Cowboys front four. You're going to have to go to Seattle. And I don't know that you can scheme your way out of that. I think eventually, and they almost had it today, you're going to have that Ohio State type of game where you can't mask with scheming Vitae. And I I think that if you can make a a deal for a Dwayne Brown from the Texans or you can bring in a Brandon Albert off the street, I think you need to at least entertain that option over the next 24 hours because I don't know that you can get by with Vitae. I tie being the long term. Yeah, I mean, answer. the only counter I would make is. The Eagles, first of all, they like to coach up their own guys and play them, and I think that's yep. what you're seeing with Vitae. But the other thing I would make is, look, I'm not saying clearly Jason Peters is a better player than Vitae, but Jason Peters is a Hall of Fame player because of what he's done 
over his whole career, not because of what he's done over the last year and a half. Peters has been playing well. I don't think, I think even, you know, you talk about Khalil Mack, Von Miller. First of all, a lot of those guys will go up against Lane. But I think if you Maybe. just... Yeah. I mean, I, the defensive coordinators might move them too. Right. And no, Lane's talked true. about that. Lane, Lane's talked about, you know, several times that they'll move guys around and put them up against a weak link on an offensive line. Coordinators will, will find your weakest yeah. player and attack it. I guess what I'm saying is, I mean, based off what I saw today... I wouldn't have felt confident against any of the Eagles' tackles going against any of those players. Obviously, I'd feel more ca- more comfortable with Peters, but I think off what Vitae showed today, I mean, look, the reality is, and this might be a topic for another discussion, Peters might never play again for the Eagles. Correct. So, yeah, you maybe you could trade for a stopgap guy, and I've said I, I would support that based off the rest of the NFC, but it would be huge for this team if Vitae could play out the rest of the season and play at a decent level, or even, you know, an above decent level, because then next year you feel more confident in your tackle situation. So, yeah, I might make a trade just for some insurance, but if I'm the Eagles, I'm starting Vitae next next Sunday against the Broncos. But that, that we can discuss that maybe in the Hot Take podcast. My, I my, get... my, yeah, my thing is that if you make a move, even if you don't play a guy next week and you release Taylor Hart, you have that week to get him into your building. You have the bye week to mm-hmm. kind of get around him and, and instill your system, and a full week of prep before you go to Dallas. I, I just don't know that if you're the Eagles in a Super Bowl caliber year based on what you saw and I know that they schemed their way around it in the second half and they did fine they didn't allow a sack in the second half of the game but I don't know that when you go up against the type of pass rushers they're going to go up against the rest of the way I I don't know that you can get by on that I think that you're going to have to pay the piper eventually if you leave Vitae out there against some of the pass rushers they're going to face and I mean look they have 52 spots on the on the roster right now. So they have they have an open an open spot there. The trade deadline's Tuesday. I'm okay with adding a tackle. I'm just saying I think Vitae looked like he deserved the shot to play again. And I'm alright with trading for one. I just don't I think we could both agree that had Vitae not played well today, we would be slamming the desk saying you gotta trade for somebody. Yep. Yep. But I think the Eagles escaped this game today feeling like they could feel good about Vitae. But one of the big takeaways outside of uh Vitae in the offensive line, Alshon Jeffrey. He had his first I mean, you called it his signature catch uh, as an Eagle so far. I think that's fair to say. Um, his best catch as an Eagle so far with his 53-yard touchdown um, in the – was it the third quarter or the third fourth? Quarter, third yep. quarter. Third um, quarter. Really, that was that was what you want to see from Alshon. 50-50 ball, Wentz put it up there. Um, Alshon went up and got it, made some players miss, went in for the score. I have my own thoughts on it. People are going to say I'm a hater, but I will have my own thoughts. So let me hear it first. I mean, you talked to Alshon after the game. Yeah. What are your takeaways from that play and what did Alshon have well, to say? Well, I, I think that – it was his signature moment as a member of the Eagles. And you and I have disagreed for a while. And we don't need to debate the entire merits right. of what he value, brings to the offense. I do think that he's opened up some room underneath for for Nelson Aguilar and for Zach Ertz. But today, you saw him become that legitimate number one wide receiver. At least for one play, mm-hmm. he showed you the value of being a number one wide receiver. And it, it was one-on-one against a rookie. And Alshon said that he's going up to Carson Wentz. And he's told him, just give me a chance. Give me a shot. Even if you think I'm covered, I'm not covered. And today, Carson trusted him. He threw it out there. And it was a 50-50 ball. Alshon caught it, streaked into the end zone, dope for the pylon, and scored. Two things there, Elliot. Number one, I think that this is the continued evolution of Wentz as a quarterback with his deep ball accuracy and his confidence with the deep ball. And number two, he Jeffrey said that he basically told Carson one route that he wanted to run on that play in the huddle, and Carson kind of switched it up and said, let's make it a go route. Think back to Monday night, mm-hmm. and it was the line of scrimmage on the two-yard line. He audibles into that play call that was the Nelson Aguilar touchdown against the Redskins. Today, he changes the route on the play call to Alshon. Those two plays right there, I think, are prime examples of just how brilliant Carson Wentz is pre-snap at reading a defense and exposing the, the, the looks that our opponents are giving them right now all right so i have a few thoughts on this my first thought is and i'll start with to everyone that follows me on twitter i saw you in my mentions saying oh j mac couldn't do that kenny stills couldn't do that for 12 million so i understand everyone thinks i hate alshon and this is not me changing my opinion on alshon the only thing is i've always said alshon's not that number one dominant receiver now today that 53 yard touchdown it was a nice it was it was a very nice catch I'm not I'm not ready to change my opinion of Alshon off of that one play. I think he's a very good number two receiver. I think he did what he was supposed to do. The Niners are one of the worst passing defenses in the NFL. I think they were 25th coming into the game. He's going against Akello Weatherspoon, a rookie who I believed was maybe, what, a second or third round pick. Um, he, he did what he was supposed to do. But if you look at outside of that, I, I, I still think him and Wentz are having trouble getting on the same page. I mean, Jeffrey was targeted... Uh, four, four times, times today. Four that twice. seems low. I feel like he was targeted a little more than that, but it says four times. 
Oh yeah, no, this is just the first half summary. That's no, he was he was he was only targeted. He was targeted uh, eight times. Okay. Eight times, two catches, sixty-two yards, with obviously fifty-three of those coming on the uh, touchdown. So I'm not going to say. Look, I always hated when running backs would have a hundred yards, and people would go, "Well, seventy of them came on one thing." Because look, you get what you get. But if we're talking about the development of their relationship and them continuing to get on the same page, he was one for seven on the other the other seven targets for like nine yards. So right. by I, comparison, though. Zach Ertz and Nelson Aguilar, who we've talked to, we've been blue in the face about this uh-huh. offense funneling through the middle, those two players had nine targets. So uh, it, you still have a majority of the passing game flowing between the hash marks. Matt Collins lined up on the outside. He was targeted three times. Well, yeah, I think there was and more. And Smith was targeted twice. And t- Yeah, Trey Burton, too. So it was it was actually 50-50 today. I, I'm not disputing your point. I do think you're right. They do, they do use the middle of the field a lot. I just think... And with this Alshon catch and this touchdown, everyone's going to be all excited about him. And I'm not here to kill the enthusiasm. The Eagles are 7-1. and one. Alshon had a great game. I'm just saying, Alshon, what Alshon did today is a step in the right direction. But I don't think this justifies him as a number one receiver. I don't think this means they should hand him a big deal this offseason. Alshon still has a lot to prove to me. And one point I want to make about Alshon, I'm not sure I've made this on the podcast. But look, after the, lo- after the game today, he talked. Alshon's a good guy. Like, you know, you, you wrote it earlier in the week about how Alshon's not worried about his touches and, you know, he knows that he's creating opportunity for other players and he knows the ball will come his way eventually. So when the Eagles sit there this offseason, if Alshon continues to have these type of games, you know, let's say he doesn't top 100 yards all season, maybe he doesn't once or twice, um, they're going to have to decide what, whether to sign him. I think Alshon's a guy I would bring back. Like, right. DeMarco Murray was a guy I wouldn't have brought back, if you want to compare to, like, semi-disappointing free agent acquisitions. DeMarco wasn't a good I, locker I room guy. I don't think I'd say that Alshon Jeffries is a semi-disappointing free agency acquisition, though. All right. I mean, I, I think mean, he's unlocked the keys to a lot of other players on the offense, and we're only eight games in. Right. Go look at what the numbers Trell Pryor is putting up Well, if I told you after nine games, Alshon would have what? Four, or after eight games, Alshon would have like well, 400, average, yeah. 400 yards and three touchdowns. Well, he, hasn't, he hasn't topped 100 yards one no, time. But, he, but he's averaging over 14 and a half yards per catch. So it's right. not like he's right. not producing. I, I just. I right, maybe semi disappointing. It, it takes some time for a quarterback and a receiver to get on the same page. Right. I don't think there's much debate. I think you bring him back. You're not going to pay him $15 million, but I don't know that there's going to be a $15 million offer on the table mm-hmm. when you look at the other free agents that will be out there and the, the numbers that he's putting up. You know, look, I, I agree with you. And, again, if that if the number's right, obviously the number has to be right. But if we're talking about paying Alshon $7 million a year, $8 million a year. around 10 no more than 10 I'd have to see a little more for 10 But I do agree with you that he helps the offense. My only thing is just, again, like, if we're going to talk about number one receiver, I'm not sure he's that yet. Maybe he develops into that with Wentz, and that's what you want, and that's why you bring him back. I guess my, my, my point I'm making is everyone thinks I hate Alshon. I would bring Alshon back. It just has to be at the right price. And one of the reasons I'd bring Alshon back, and, I, and you know, not to sound cliche and, like, super sports righty, but he has been a good locker room guy. And I think even though he's not super talkative with us and he's kind of a – quiet, southern, like, South Carolina guy. Teammates love him. Teammates love him, which wasn't really the case with DeMarco. But That's an understatement. Yeah, but but also, I think Alshon, I mean, when they signed him, I wrote, this is, you know, boomer bust situation because one-year deal, he's a guy that's using the Eagles to try to get paid. I thought if he wasn't getting his numbers, he would talk up, you know, he would, like, complain to the media and stuff. Now, the fact they're 7-1 and one helps, obviously. But I think he has really embraced his role as I mean, he's he's not. I mean, he might be the number one targeted receiver, but Ertz is the one is the number one offensive weapon. Yep. Aguilar is up there. He probably has more targets, if yep. not they're close. Yep. Um, I mean, Jeffrey. I don't want to call him a role player, but he has not been like a focal point number one receiver, and that's probably what he thought he was going to be. So I give him credit for embracing that role. And today, what you saw is like you know, we we could say yeah, maybe Matt Collins can be there next year, and you know, I've said I thought Marcus Johnson is pretty good. They're not ready to make that type of catch. No matter who it's against, they're not making that type of catch. Can can Alshon make that catch against a number one type cornerback? No, not many receivers can. I mean, there's only probably four or five in the league that can out jump a Richard Sherman, a Patrick Peterson, a Josh Norman, those type of guys. But you did see the benefit of having Alshon. And again, it makes it an interesting decision for the offseason. But. Yep, and we talked about it Friday. Matt Collins. Three three targets. Torrey Smith only had two today. So I think you're going to continue to slowly see Matt Collins emerge as that outside receiver opposite of Alshon Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. They had him in on a series or two where he was on the outside, and he wound up on those um, three targets, catching two of them for 30 yards. 
Mac Holland is coming along. Alshon Jeffrey's coming yeah. along. Nelson Aguilar has found a home in the slot. He's thriving there. Zach Ertz is a premier tight end in the NFL. This offense is firing on all cylinders. And, and even though Jeffrey's numbers, if you want to say that they're not what you expected them to be, he's over what, 365, 370 yards through eight games? They're not, not great. great I mean, come on. You got to admit they're not great. Right, they weren't what they were in Chicago, but it's the trickle-down effect on the rest of the offense, which is the value that right. I think he brings. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. And, and the other thing that I'll say is— And don't, don't forget, Wentz is getting better each week. Wentz, would Wentz make that throw in week two? Yeah, I think he would. I just don't think Alshon would have caught well, it. I, Alshon <laughs> made those throws in week— He didn't, I mean, he didn't, I mean, he Wentz didn't made those... the throw against the Giants Went, in week three. Uh, Okay, well, yeah, he missed that wide open throw. Right. But are, you, are you talking about the fifty-fifty balls? I, I'm, I'm talking about the fifty-fifty ball because he threw he those him. in week one against Washington. Right, Alshon I mean, had two but this was this was a dime. I yeah, mean, he no, dropped it right in where it needed. Well, to I actually fit. give Alshon more credit for the catch than I do Wentz, but also Wentz missed Alshon in the end zone in the in the yeah. uh, first half. I mean, yeah. I, and we, we we could be talking about you know close to a hundred yards, two touchdown game from Alshon. Yeah, my today. point is that Wentz is steadily improving on his deep ball accuracy, his mm-hmm. deep ball confidence. He's airing it out more often. I think he's fourth in the league in completions over 25 yards, according to Pro Football Focus. So he's improving, and as he improves, I think you're going to see the production from Jeffrey continue along that bell curve. Yeah, and honestly, I don't think it's so much about Wentz improving his skills or Alshon improving his skills. I just think they need more time together. Yep. And that was always my thing with the one-year deal and all that. But um, Wentz, I mean, I can't believe we've gone 21 minutes when this podcast, since it <laughs> seemed like every other week we talk about Wentz for nine minutes to start. I thought he was okay today. Missed the throw to Alshon. Um, his interception he had to Matt Collins. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Wentz after the game. I would go ahead and guess that was some type of miscommunication or, or a missed throw. I don't think that was a, a poor like a, a, a throw that was not accurate. I think he thought Hollins was going to be there. Um, that's going to happen. So he had the interceptions, two touchdowns. Didn't think he was especially accurate on the day. Didn't think he was especially good. But he got the job done. I mean, look, they won by 23 points. Uh, he threw for, I think, 211 yards. He ended up with 18 of 32, 211 yards. Sacked three times. Um, what did he end up with rushing? Uh, only seven yards rushing. Didn't do much with his legs today. But I, I thought he played well. I gave him, on my report card, I gave him a B-. minus. A few people in the press box were saying C+. Plus, I, but, I'd have him at about a C+. Plus. Yeah, so I, I think, look, they, they showed they can win today when Wentz isn't at his best, which yep. is good. Um, and I think Wentz showed outside of the interception, I mean – you know, obviously, I think C.J. Bathard had one interception as well. His or two interceptions, two interceptions. One was and his were six. his were uglier, in my yep. opinion. Yep. Uh, Wentz was more of a fluke. Um, yeah, so when you yeah. have a passer rating of forty six point nine, you didn't exactly not have good. a great yeah. day at the office. Yeah, Wentz eighty four point two today. So I mean, yeah. roughly half. I mean, double of what Bathard did. And you said it. The big takeaway is this team found a way to win a game when Carson Wentz wasn't the catalyst. I mean, mm-hmm. we we look back to the game against Washington. He willed them to victory in that game based on what he did on third down and a couple key throws. You can say that it was a combination of the defense and Wentz that beat the Carolina Panthers back on Thursday Night Football two weeks ago. Today, Wentz wasn't as sharp. I I. I don't think that he was as as bad as we saw at times during his rookie year, but I think that a lot of the issues were due to the fact that he faced an onslaught of pressure in the first half, was under duress for a significant part of that half, and when he was able to calm down, get some time in the pocket, he, he played at a higher level, it was a rainy day. Again, I had Carson Wentz at number two in the power rankings this week among quarterbacks. Might drop him down a slot or two because I don't think that he was exactly brilliant today. But he made enough plays for them to win the game. He yeah. made the throw to Zach Ertz, who was wide open in the end zone. Uh, career high, six touchdowns for Ertz. He's now been targeted six times in the end zone all year, six for six. And he made the throw to Alshon Jeffrey, a perfectly thrown ball. So... I can't kill Carson Wentz. I think he was around a C plus or maybe where you went on the optimistic side of B minus and yeah. the Eagles won the game and that's a testament to this team. Yeah, I agree. And I mean look, every week we talk about or last two weeks we've said, you know, M V P candidate, M V P candidate. The number today is gonna to be seven. The fact that he has his team at seven wins, which is yep. gonna be the most in the NFL, that's where his M V P candidacy is helped today. Um but one player I wanted to talk about uh, on the defensive side, I don't think there's much to talk about on defense. I mean, Niners have a terrible offense, but Jalen Mills today um, gets his interception, his third of the year, brings it back 37 yards, came when the team was up 9 nothing, so it's still a pretty close game. Two-point conversion puts him up 17 nothing. After the game, he talked about it, and he said, you know, he studied film all week. He got the look he wanted from Pierre Garçon. He trusted his instincts. He jumped the route. I mean, so this wasn't like it didn't get thrown right into his hands. This this was work he did to, to make this play. Yep. Brings it back 37 yards for the touchdown. Here's what I'm going to ask you about Mills. And we'll have this conversation briefly because I think this is something we could go about for an hour and we will in the offseason. 
I've said it time and time again. I'm not ready just to hand his starting job away to Ronald Darby or Sidney Jones. I understand you have more invested in them. I understand they have higher pros- they they were considered higher prospects. I get all of that. But you can't look at what this guy does week in and week out. You can't be a head coach that preaches competition. You can't be Corey Undlin, a guy that's invested a lot of Mills. And then as soon as Ronald Darby and Sidney Jones are healthy, you just bench well, who's, Mills. Who's to say that Mills gets benched? I mean, you can well, they're not could- gonna- you can obviously bench Rasul Douglas and play Ronald Darby in that spot. Yeah, and then, well, I guess we'll see what happens with Sidney Jones. But I guess my point is this. I don't think they're going to start Sidney Jones week one if he plays at all this year. Right. No, that's fair. But I guess I'm talking more about in training camp next year. I mean, there's going to be the three guys. Maybe Patrick Robinson's back. Maybe moving to safety. I guess my overall point is this is a guy that's been ripped by fans. Pro football folks folk has called him probably the worst quarterback in the, cornerback in the NFL last year. I think he's made a huge leap forward this year. His, he's not a numbers guy. He's not a guy that you know is going to hold a guy to one catch for twelve Three yards. Three interceptions after not having an interception his rookie year. One of them is a pick six. That's a yeah. That's a pretty big improvement. Yeah, no, it is. But I, I guess with him, like it's never pretty. Today it was with that interception return. But I just think when you look at this Eagles defense, they're a tough unit. They create turnovers. You know, the, the bend don't break. I think a lot of the, this team's personality comes from Jalen Mills. And if I'm the Eagles. I would be hesitant to move away from that. And I know they've invested in other cornerbacks, and they could be just as good as as, uh, Jalen Mills. We'll see. I just think Jalen Mills deserves a shot at this job, whether it be this season or next year. He's been your number one cornerback. He's done everything you've asked from him. I'm not saying he's been perfect, but I think this guy deserves a shot at the job. Yeah, I mean, listen, when Ronald Darby comes back and he's fully healthy, he's going to get one of the starting cornerback jobs. And I think you sit down with Sewell Douglas, who's done an admirable job, but I don't think that the coaching staff went into this year thinking that they wanted to play him significant snaps this year. I think he's exceeded expectations and he's improved every week, sure. Mm-hmm. But Ronald Darby is, is your most athletic. He's your number one cornerback. He traded a third-round pick in Jordan Matthews for him. I think you got to play him when he's healthy. And as far as Sidney Jones goes, I think you have less urgency to bring him back now. If he's not 100% healthy, Jalen Mills has played his way into that job for the rest of the year. But I think going into next season, Sidney Jones is a starting corner. Ronald Darby is a starting corner. And you you figure out where where Jalen Mills fits. You might even slide him to safety. I don't know how long-term Rodney McLeod and Malcolm Jenkins are both here. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, you invested a lot in Sidney Jones, the number two pick. You invested a lot in Ronald Darby, who is a, a pretty damn good player. I'm not saying that you just hand them the job without any sort of competition, but your first defensive snap, somebody has to be on the field. And I think my first defensive snap, not that this would be the depth chart come week one, but I would have Ronald Darby and Sidney Jones out there. And if Jalen Mills is out there with Darby in the slot, or if Jalen Mills is at safety or he's in some sort of nickel look, that's different. But I don't think that Jalen Mills, and we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think that Jalen Mills is essentially one of your first plays of camp cornerbacks yeah we'll see um but look i think the fact we've been talking about this i mean think of what we're talking about right now we're talking about the eagles are seven and one and we're talking about what are they going to do all their cornerbacks they have so i don't think we would have ever guessed after the game against the niners back in training camp we would be talking about this after a win so a big win for the eagles today they moved to seven and one game against the broncos next week uh, i think they're going to win that game that's my initial pick we'll go we'll go um with it throughout the week but i think that's about all to take away i mean we're on tuesday we're going to do our uh our hot take podcast with Joe Giglio. So as usual, um, if you're listening, please tweet us, uh, yep. some, tweet us your, your take on this game. What'd you see from Alshon? What'd you see from Jalen Mills? What was your takeaway from this game? Use hashtag the no huddle show or email us at the no huddle show at NJ and we'll read them on the podcast. And I always enjoy doing that show of we'll Joe in here. And I'm sure we'll look much more ahead to the Broncos in that game. Yep. Make sure to follow Elliot at Elliot short parks. I'm at Matt Lombardo PHL. Uh, you can join the debate there. You can suggest topics for the show and uh, just have some fun. It's always yeah. a great time. And as always, I think we're up to, oh man, I, t- I should have checked this before we started. I said I wanted to get up to 200 we're by at Dallas. 177, we're I at 177, man. We, we might get to 200 by, by Denver. Yeah. But I appreciate all the ratings. I appreciate yes, all the reviews. We read all of them. We're up to four and a half stars. We worked our way up to that, man. We were at like three, I think, when we started off a few haters at the beginning. But we're up to four and a half. So I appreciate everybody doing that. We're going to get out of here. It's starting to rain a lot more now, so I'm going to hurry up and get to my car. Matt, I appreciate it. We'll talk to you guys on Tuesday. See you Tuesday.